Hey everyone, it's Fox from models.co.uk here, back with part three of our advanced weathering techniques using the ammo of MIG weathering products. Uh, if you remember, we're working on the Bandai Mega Size 148 scale RX-78 II Gundam. And today we're going to start off with a new technique. I'm just going to move this out of the way. We're going to start off with a new technique, uh, which we're going to be applying to the tops of the legs and the feet. Uh, and we're going to be using... Uh, the heavy chipping effects from ammo for MIG and we're also going to be using good old-fashioned engine grime which we've used before you know all about that so what are we going to be doing we're going to be basically putting some sort of filthy nonsense here around the crotch uh, and on the other leg and then on the feet now you can see here I've masked off this leg this is a very time sensitive process and I'll be honest with you uh, it's quite finickety. Uh, I have been practicing this on some spare sprues and it's timing critical so I can't do the whole thing at once. I'm going to do it bit by bit. So this thigh, then that thigh, then one foot, then the other. It's, it's all in the timing. So what are we going to do? Well the first thing we're going to do, this is basically the same as the hairspray technique but the idea is that the heavy chipping fluid is a bit more controllable than hairspray. You can airbrush it. It gives you a bit more control over what you're putting onto the model. It doesn't stain the model uh, and it's water soluble so the idea is we'll put a layer of this on here uh, that will dry, we'll maybe give it a second coat then we'll put on the, when it's dry, we'll put on the engine grind with the airbrush let that dry for not very long at all then we'll go over with some water and a brush and brush away the grime we don't want and it should hopefully fingers crossed leave a nice mixture of streaks and rain spots and all kinds of nonsense now, as I say, I've tried this a few times on some spare sprues, and it's either worked brilliantly or gone horribly wrong. So it is quite precise. You've got to get it just right. So I'm quite nervous about this. There's no guarantees this is going to work. Now take our airbrush, which you can't see, and I'm going to put a small amount of the heavy chipping into the airbrush. Not a lot, just a little tiny bit. A couple of drops, or half a cup in that case. And the first thing we're going to do is apply... The chipping fluid to the model. So I'm just going to turn the airbrush on. This is where it gets noisy. Right, so we're going to apply, we're going to do it in a light coat. If you do it too thick, it goes really bubbly and the effect comes out completely wrong. So I'm just going to slap it all over here. So let's get that done, shall we? Now it is really hard to see where it's going because it's a clear fluid. So obviously that's a bit challenging. And it doesn't necessarily shine when it's wet, which also makes it a bit of a challenge. Now this might go out of shot while I do this. But basically, just putting it all over. Building up a nice coat. It'll go slightly lumpy, but that's fine. that's a good healthy coat. I'm going to leave that to dry just for a few minutes, uh, basically until it looks dry and then I'll go ahead and do a second coat. Just a quick bit of info for you, this is still the first coat and it's drying, it takes a few minutes. When you first put it on um, it looks a little bit lumpy and bumpy, just a little tiny bit. This is fine, don't worry about that, apparently it's uh, supposed to do that. Some of my early experiments I put it on too thick uh, and it came out really lumpy like like a diseased face or something. That's probably too much and I had some problems with the next bit after that. So the rule of thumb seems to be spray it on lightly. You can't see it going on, which is which makes it difficult, but you'll get little, tiny little goosebumps as it were. This seems to be normal. So when you get to about that point, stop, that should be enough. It does say in the book, two to three coats. I'm gonna do two coats. Um, so as I said before, I'll go off and let this first coat dry a bit more. Okay, right, the second coat is on and it's drying. Uh, again, only takes a few minutes. A little uh, bit more advice. Unfortunately, there's things I can't show you because I'm so time critical, I, ha I can't take time out to, to explain things. So, once you've got your chipping effects on, I'm doing two coats. You can do one or three. Uh, by the way, chipping effects is a MIG 2011. Uh, this is heavy chipping. Uh, once you've got that on, you need to clean your airbrush out, and this is water soluble. So you just clean your airbrush out with water, clean water, uh, ready for the next 
session, which is the engine grime. So get your coats on, clean your brush out with the water. By the time you've done that, it should be almost dry, getting dry. You'll know when it's dry because it will go flat. And where there were little lumps and bumps, you'll see little what look like water spots. That's basically, you can't really see them on camera, but there are still some bits where I can see the little lumps and bumps. But it'll look like water spotting. That means it's dry. It takes a few minutes. Once that's done, it's time to go in with the engine grime. Now, this is normally a technique you do through acrylic paints. You put an acrylic paint over the top and then chip it back. Like I said, it's the same as the hairspray technique. But we're going to be doing with it with engine grime which is an enamel paint and you have to do it a little bit differently right okay this has had a few minutes to dry uh, about five minutes now we're going to go ahead and put the engine grime on so what we're going to do is take our uh, a mig 1407 engine grime and we're going to put a little bit into the airbrush now this bit is uh, fairly straightforward we're just going to get the airbrush again and we're going to cover these parts so again you're going to see some upskirt shots of uh, rx 72 you'll see as well i've taken the back uh, skirts off in the sides just to keep things easy so let's get the airbrush on make sure we've got some paint coming through and we're going to do a light coat not a heavy coat but a light coat so let's get this and we're going to stick to the painted areas if we can so let's get that out of the way the bits that I've covered in masking chipping fluid even so a bit under there a bit on the top on the sides don't be afraid to just go straight in. We're doing a light coat, as I said, not a massively heavy coat. Get some on the leg. I'm going to try and fade it out a bit as well towards the as it goes down the leg. Right, so that is on. I'm going to leave it for literally a few minutes. Um, just You don't want it to dry completely, obviously, because then it will just go horribly wrong. So I'm literally going to leave it like a minute or two now. Right, so it's had a minute or two to do its thing. Uh, what we're going to do now is take this back off again. Uh, and this is where I start waving the camera over. I'm just going to take this paper off. So what we want to do now is take it off again. As I say, don't leave it too long because it will then just become impossible. So I'm going to take a normal brush this is my scruffy brush but i'm going to use it anyway i'm going to got some ordinary water just bog standard water i'm going to dip it in the water take a tiny amount of it off and all i'm going to do is go like this if this works this may not work let's see what happens very very gently i'm just going to start scraping and when i say scraping i mean very gently just dragging it across the surface almost no pressure at all more water and hopefully what should happen is that the water should activate the streaking the chipping fluid and that will pull the paint off say so I've done some experiments and it hasn't always worked so it is quite finicky it's also quite difficult to get this in shot while I'm doing it. Get some more water on that. And again, I'm almost not touching the piece at all. I'm hardly touching it. There we go. That's what we want. Perfect. So you can see there it's making these little streaks. I can do a bit on that. I hope you can see all this. The more you do, the more comes off. You can use a smaller brush for smaller streaks if you want. But again, you can't take your time. I want it to fade out as it goes down the leg, so I'm doing more at the bottom of the leg. see that because it's at a funny angle but hopefully you can if I'm focusing at the bottom of this plate it'll take off more at the bottom and less at the top and I just want this kind of random streaky effect and the trick I've found with this if you just put the thinning fluid on and leave it for a while and then put the enamel on and leave that for a while it's 
let's be honest, it's just going to look like ass. It's going to look terrible. Because all it's going to do is smear and just not work like this at all. You have to, quite literally, get the enamel paint on as soon as the chipping fluid looks dry. And then you have to get the enamel paint off and start this process literally within one or two minutes of the enamel paint going on. You don't want the enamel paint to dry because that's where it will just go horribly wrong. Because enamel paint is not water soluble, the chipping fluid is. And what you're doing is you're counting on the chipping fluid breaking up when you wet it and taking the enamel paint with it. If the enamel paint is too dry then it's just not going to work, it's just going to make streaks. And you can see here, I've only been doing this for a couple of minutes, but the enamel paint is becoming more of a challenge to come off. Just because it's been on for a bit longer. Now you can jab, you can jab at it if you want. You've kind of got your take your time, but also not take your time, it's really weird. Now this bit's going to be hard for you to see well, but... And the, the other thing is, of course, because we faded it a little bit, when we put the enamel paint on, we didn't just do a big blob of enamel paint. Wow, this is fiddly. Um, we kind of faded it a bit. So it won't just be a big block of colour with an edge. I'm going to try a smaller brush. This is my Uwe floppy brush. See if I can get some smaller streaks going on. Again, I'm just being very gentle. But you can see here the paint's putting up more of a, a fight now because it's been on for longer. Go that way and take some of these edges off. But that's fine. We want it to look random, we want it to look grimy and dirty. Your mileage may vary. Okie dokie, right, uh, that's all been done. I did film doing a foot, but unfortunately the video didn't come out, so I can't show you that. It's now been done. The top of the thighs have been done quite nicely, quite subtle. You can see it's come out quite nicely. The legs as well came out rather pleasant. I think I went a bit overboard with, the, with these parts, uh, but I'm happy with it. That's kind of the effect I was looking for, is this kind of slightly scratched and streaky look. I uh, didn't get that all over. Uh, I think the trick with this, with the engine ground when you're using it, I was quite cautious with it. I didn't put a lot on. I think the trick is just to put a lot on because I found that where the paint was thicker, I got the desired effect. Uh, where it was thinner, I just kind of got discoloring and less of the, the chippy streaking. So I think the trick might be to put on more than you need. But I'm quite happy with it. It's come out really dirty and grubby, so I'm quite chuffed with that. That should give some good results. There's more stuff to go on there anyway, so it's not the end of the world. However, there was a bit of a disaster. Isn't there always with my stuff? I decided to take this leg off to paint the end rather than just mask the other leg off like I did with the first one. Brilliant, no problem, except when I took the leg off, the rod that holds it in place on the waist decided to shatter. Ah. Uh. I think it's more of the uh, thinners affecting the plastic and somewhere I haven't primed or not realised I haven't primed. So this is two halves. The back half stayed on, the front half kind of shattered. The end piece with this end cap on the end was still inside the poly cap here inside the leg. Managed to rescue that, glued it back on and I filled it with some milliput in the hope that it will be strong enough to take the leg and hold it in place. I'll just have to not move it around much. My only worry now is I've got to hope that this milliput cures. Uh, last time I used milliput, um, I was bizarrely trying to backfill uh, a light switch cover, like you get on the wall, to use as a diorama. Filled it full, it never cured. So, my big worry now is that this milliput just doesn't cure. Eh, uh, I don't know. It's all. If it can go wrong, it'll go wrong. So anyway, enough about that. We'll just have to keep an eye on this. Kind of puts the kibosh on a few things because I can't put the leg back on now until this is fully cured and I can sand it back a bit. So stay tuned for that. Happiness, happiness. But the legs are done and I'm quite pleased with them. I say it's not exactly what I intended, but it's an interesting look and I can I can work with that. So right. So what's next? Next up, we are going to be doing some uh, filters. 
on the parts and these are just really quick filters just to to tint the white parts make all the different weathering kind of blend a bit more give it a unified kind of color scheme they're very subtle so i'll go and get the filters now uh, and i'll quickly show you how to put that on once we've done that uh, we're on to weathering powders uh, and then i think we're done say for a few of the little bits i'm going to do that aren't in the book so let me go and get the uh, the filters and we'll crack on with that back in a moment okay so we're going to be using the brown for white filter if you can see that uh, it's a amig 1500 and as you can see from the messy pot it's like the panel line wash when you shake it it tends to go everywhere so just be wary of that when you're shaking it around uh, i've gone ahead and done most of the model apart from one leg this leg hasn't been done i wanted to try it out and you might be able to see on the head here although my white balance is a bit rubbish uh, the tint itself has been given to this part not so much on here it didn't seem to to do much on there but it's definitely been applied to the back of the head and gives it that nice sort of slight brownie tinge to it did it on the front skirts as well um, I'll show you obviously the difference between the two legs let me move that out of the way this is a super super subtle effect as are all the effects I do and I always say that uh, let's just focus in case of this leg has been done this leg hasn't so you can see here Hopefully, on this camera with this colour balance, there's a very slight tinge to this white area. And same on the other side. Ever so slightly tinged. I do think the back of these legs looks much better than the front. I don't know why. This has had a slight tinge to it. This is the original, as you can see. There's a very slight difference. I mean, some of the streaking I did tinted it anyway. Uh, but there is a very slight difference. Now, it's very easy to actually apply, so I'm going to do that now. Uh, and the trick with this is... Bear in mind that this uh, filter is basically a thinned enamel paint, the same as most of the other products in this range. They're just variations on enamel paints and how thin they are. So just move that. And this is very simple to do. And all these steps I'm doing, they are completely optional. It just really depends on how weathered you want your vehicle to be. I've actually already put a lot of tint into the surface when I did things like the streaking grimes. Um, so you wouldn't have to necessarily do this stage. I'm just doing it so I can show you. Uh, now you want to make sure you shake this well and as I said this does tend to go everywhere so I'm just being really careful. I'm shaking it a lot. There is one other thing with these enamel products as well that I've noticed like this and the panel line wash. They do tend to separate out really quickly when they're in the pot. And what I was noticing was um, that when you were getting stuff from the pot to put on the model after a few brush fulls that you'd applied you were basically just putting thinner on, the pigments had separated out really quickly in the pot. So what i found you have to do is really get some on your brush, apply it to an area, give the paint a quick stir, or the, the filter a quick stir, and then do the same again. You can see there I've got, shh, I've just come off on my fingers. I don't know what it is with these plastic lids, but don't assume they contain the liquid inside the pot all that well. Don't make that assumption, because you will just get mess. So we're going to take the filter, we're going to rub all the paint that's come off onto my gloves, and this is deliciously simple. Just take yourself a normal brush, any size brush will do, and quite simply, get some of this on the brush. I'll put it in shot, it might help. Get some of it on the brush, get most of it off, and then just apply to the surface. You're not trying to do it like a wash, you don't want it flooding over the surface. Again, remember, you're just applying a tint. So you don't want brush marks, you don't want it flowing into lines. I mean, you might get brush marks. I certainly am here, so I'm going to keep it in that direction of streaks. And this actually might be a little bit too much. But it all just goes to the look. It will lighten as it dries, it'll become less obvious. But you're not putting on like a wash, as in you're not having it pool and collecting edges. You might see it better if I got it in shot, that would be a really great idea. Um, let's get it on there. I have to reload the brush now. And what you'll find is as you're applying it, um, especially on white areas, you'll be putting it on and you'll be not seeing anything. That just means you need to stir it around again because it's it's separated out in the pot. See there, it's going on th not as dark now. It's already separated out in the pot. So let me just quickly stir that with the. I'm going to use the end of the brush because I've just got it available. Give it a good stir. 
You do have to do that quite a lot, actually, because it does separate out so fast. Also, I'm trying to do this while manhandling this. You can see it's a darker shade. That's probably far too much. So I can spread that out. And that's all we're hoping to achieve is just add this tint to the piece. Comes out better on white. And again, it is purely optional. You can do as much, oh, get it on camera, dear boy, as much or as little as you like. There we go. I'm getting some slight brush strokes in there, but as long as I keep them parallel to the direction of flow, they'll just look like streaks, which is fine by me. So okay. And that's it. That is how you apply a filter. I'll just go and do it over the rest of this leg. I'm going to do it on all the external arm parts. Um, I'll go and do the rest of this leg and then I shall get the pigments ready because that's going to be the next step. You couldn't see that, could you, because of this big knee. Dum. That wasn't a very well filmed bit. Do apologise for that, but I've got to navigate this whole leg around, this whole torso, torso. What am I talking about? I really am talking nonsense today. All these legs. Anyway, let me go and get the pigments ready, and when we come back, we'll start doing that bit. Back in a moment. Right, so I gave you completely the wrong information in that last section. Uh, the next bit is not weathering powders just yet. Uh, we're going to be doing some mud splatters. Uh, it's the next step in the book. Now, what we need for this is we need a stiff brush, a uh, cocktail stick. Uh, we also need some MIG 1402 fresh mud and some 1408 fresh engine oil. You mix this in a roughly 70-30 ratio, so 70% of this oil engine oil and 30% of the fresh mud. I just completely did it by eye, and you'd come up with this. The engine oil is a nice sort of greasy colour and the fresh mud is obviously brown. And it's dead simple. All you do is you get your brush, you get some of your mix on there, get a chunk of it off. And it takes a little bit of practice to get it going in the right direction. But quite simply, you get your cocktail stick and you flick the paint. And it's difficult to remember which way you want to flick it. But literally get the cocktail stick on the brush and just flick. And all you're looking for is little splat marks. You can do as much, as always you can do as much or as little as you want. Because it's enamel paint and it stays wet for so long you can go around and tidy things up if you've got too much splatting in one area you can you know go and take that off clean it up if you've got a big splat that looks like I say far too big you can just go and get rid of that with a brush with a bit of thinner on it and that's paint splatting and I think that'll do for the splatting of the paint so I'm just going to go and clean my brush off with some of my thinners and then when we come back when this has had a little while to dry uh, we'll, we'll then come back and then we'll do the pastels. <sighs> Hope if I get the play order right, wouldn't it? So, let me just see if I can get you a better view of that uh, with the light. Hopefully you can see that, hopefully. Uh, yeah, I'm quite pleased with that. Nice splatty paint effect. I might go and tidy up this bit a bit because it is a bit thick and it's running down. So, I'll go and clean that up and when we come back we shall do the pastels. Back in a moment. Right, okay, that's our time to dry. I've left it for, actually for a couple of days, to be honest, because I got tied up doing other things. Um, it's come out quite nicely. There is one side downside to using the fresh engine oil, though, and that is that it comes out shiny. Um, so it's got this kind of shiny texture, little spots all over it now. You can see it, I don't know if you'll see it on camera, but you can see it here. Um, so I'm going to have to get handy with the matte varnish. Now, it kind of helps me with the next step as well, because the next step is to use weathering powders. 
and I'll explain why in a moment. But we're going to be using two. We're going to be using MIG 3008 uh, Track Rust, if you can see that, if it's in focus. And we're going to be using MIG 3007 Dark Earth, probably more of the Dark Earth than the Track Rust, because I don't really want to do a lot of rust, although I've kind of put it all over here. So, uh, but we're going to stick to mostly the Dark Earth, uh, and we're going to apply pigments to... Do -ba -do -ba -do. Pigments to inside the feet here, wibbly wobbly, inside the feet here because it's still quite clean in there and I need to gum it up a bit, and also to the backs of the knees uh, as it suggests in the book. Now, uh, you know the problems I've had with thinners on this model kit, you know that some of the panel line wash accidentally got into the, let's just sort them out, some panel line wash actually got into the joints inside the knees where primer hadn't got coverage uh, by accident and it shattered the knees and I had to rebuild them so I'm obviously consciously aware of that uh, and it's specific to the plastic in Bandai kits I, ha I hasten to repeat not a problem with the enamel products uh, with Bandai kits you just have to be extra careful when you're priming make sure everything gets covered even insides of parts that you're never going to see because the problem is that their plastics are quite susceptible to any thinners enamel thinners oil thinners acrylic thinners anything like that so when you traditionally apply these pigments, you put them on, and I'll show you how, and then you set them in place with the pigment fixer. Now you can either use your standard enamel thinners, or in my case the Artist Oil Odorless Thinners, or you can use MIG's uh, very own pigment fixer, which is a MIG 3000. Uh, which if you open it and smell it, actually smells just like white spirit or terps. So it probably is. And traditionally what you'll do is you'll put the powders on, uh, and then you'll take some of the thinners or the fixing agent on the brush and you'll just dot it on and it will absorb into the pigments and hold them in place. That's fine, except the last thing I want to do is do that and then it all go into the joints and I have cracking joints again. So, via some kind of synchronicity, I'm going to have to do what I wasn't going to do originally, which is matte varnish this because of the shiny um, fresh engine oil. So what I'm going to do is put the pigments on and then I'm going to seal them in place with the matte varnish. Uh, I'm going to put you know, matte varnish on the armour parts, but I'm going to have to go quite lightly on these because these are supposed to be shiny. So I'm going to have to seal them in with the matte varnish and a light dusting. Hopefully that will seal the pigments in. Uh, and then what I can do if I need to is go back later on with uh, either brushed on gloss varnish or uh, chrome silver dry brushing just to bring back some shine to these metal parts because these are supposed to be shinier than the armour. So, let me just get the camera set up and we shall get on with the pigments. Okie dokie, so let's get started. So, we have our Dark Earth AMIG 3007. And applying these couldn't be any simpler. Uh, we simply take the part we want to put pigment on. And get this in shot. And we simply... Get a brush, take a small amount of the pigment on the brush, and then we just put it on. I'm going to put some in here, just a small amount, and dot some on the leg. I'm not putting on tons, and I'll show you why. A little bit more maybe. Uh, get some on here. It's basically a powder, you can see it's just a powder. Take a little bit more, and we're just going to put it on this side as well. Let's move this leg out of the way. If you can see this, put some more into that piston thing, and we'll put some more around the... It doesn't help that you can't really see this. I can't move this leg much, because this is the leg who's hip shattered. Now, if I was clever, I would have put some paper down here to collect this powder, but hey, what am I going to do? So I'm just going to set that down. Get most of the powder back off the brush into the pot. And now, all I'm going to do is munge it about. I'm just going to quickly do this bit so it doesn't all fall off when I turn it over. So, all we do is take the brush and just work that in. It's very similar to Tamiya powders and you just work it in. You can do it all over the surface. Just lightly, and it's, at the moment it's just a small amount, so it's just giving a little bit of a stain. So what I might do is take some more, and get 
generous with it so you'll see now I'm just going to put it on quite thickly and work it in that way so I'll just tip that off and I'm really just squishing it and pushing it around just to get into these little crooks and nannies if I tap that off what you'll find is a lot of it will just stay in the panel lines Some more on the back. I hope this is in shot. I'm to navigate different legs. Hang on. This is actually quite difficult. There we go. That's a bit better. Get some more on here. Move this over there. Getting powder everywhere, but hey, that's part of the fun. If you're not getting messy doing this, then you're not doing it right. Now, if you're going for a thick dark earth look, you'd put this on real as a real thick powder and then set it in place with the pigment fixer uh, and then that would then harden down but of course because I'm limited by the fact I can't go too heavy with anything on these plastics it does limit me somewhat so let's just get some more on here think of this as just like paint but without the actual oils or anything else it's just really the pigments that you would get in a paint. So I'm really getting more of a dusty look because I can't go too heavy because I can't put pigment fixer on it. I can in some places. Just go quite heavy in there. Get it in this joint. Also want to make sure I get the front of the knee. That's just as important. This is probably horribly out of focus for you now. So bear with me. And don't worry that you're putting on too much because this will disappear when you either varnish it or put fixer on it. So I think that's going to do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get daring and I'm actually going to try some pigment fixer. Let's give it a try. I'll try a small amount. I've not got it clumped on too much. I'm going to take a different brush and I'm going to get some pigment fixer. Not too much. I don't want to drown the piece. I'm just going to dot it on. I hope you can see that. Dot it on. And again, by the marvels of our old friend capillary action, it actually soaks through. Now I've got this on quite thin, so it's probably not the best solution, but I'll do it on these bits. Ideally, what you're supposed to do is wash the piece in the, in the pigment fixer, and that has the desired effect. But I can't really afford to do that too much. Not with this joint. So what I'm doing is I can do it on the armour pieces because they're not too bad. I don't have to worry about those too much. And what you find is as you put the pigment fixer on, the pigment sort of is locked into place more or less. And it also fades slightly. runs around a bit you get a bit of a wash effect so it will look completely different to when you put the powder on now if you wanted just a dusty effect you could just leave it as it was if your model's never going to be handled then this may not be such a big problem you may not have to actually fix it it just may come off with repeated handling so obviously you want to make sure you're not going to be repeatedly handling the model now this isn't going to be a handled model once it's done it's done I don't need to touch anything again so I should be fine so I'm actually tempted to leave that as it is and just do a little bit of matte varnish I'll go brave and I'll put some pigment fixer on it just to see what happens 
Now I'm not dousing it on, I'm not soaking the parts, so hopefully I'm putting on just a little amount, not so much that it's going to run into any nooks and crannies. Hopefully just enough that it will seal this in place without getting inside the actual joint. Here we are, fingers crossed. This is a big daring moment for me. If this is the last episode in this series, then you know the whole thing fell apart and it all went wrong. Right, so I might be tempted to leave it at that and see what happens. So I'm going to leave that to set for a little while. Then I'll come back and do the other leg. And apologies if you couldn't see any of that. I'll leave that to set for a little while. I'll go off and do the feet and the other knee. Um, and then when we come back, I shall tell you whether my entire leg fell apart or whether we've had huge success. I know which one I'm hoping for. Now remember, if you're doing pigments on a regular standard model kit, not a, not a gumpler like this, what you would actually do is really load it with the pigments and then just almost literally wash the pigment fixer over. That way you get real clumpy earth effects. Uh, this is more of a light dusty coating just to suggest, I don't know, wear and gunk and grime. But you could really pile the powder on uh, and the technique for that will be, and I'll just sacrifice a bit of my mat to show you. If you'd really pile the powder on, you'd literally get your bit of pigment fixer and touch it to it like that. That would soak into the pigment and where it's on really thick it will stay lumpy and textured and you'd have that look of caked on earth. Uh, but for the purposes of this model I can't really do that. I can't afford to take that risk with these knee joints. So I've got to hope that that's enough now to keep the pigments there. Hopefully it will be. As I say this is never really going to be handled. The joints aren't going to be touched at any point. So even a loose pigment would be fine. If you're using something like Tamiya uh, Weathering Master Pastels, it's very similar. It's the same kind of principle. It's a pigment, but that's more sticky and adhesive. So you could dot that on and it, it wouldn't come off unless you touched it. Uh, because these are loose pigments, they can just be knocked off or fall off. So that's why you need the pigment fixer. Uh, but I shall go away and do the feet and the other knee. And hopefully when we come back, I'll still have an intact pair of legs. Wish me luck. Back in a moment. Okay, right, we are back. The pigments have now been applied uh, and have dried. In the end, I didn't use the pigment fixer on the rest of the parts I was doing. I just stuck to um, fixing them in place with the matte varnish. So I applied all the pigments as you see, saw me do on the knee, uh, then very carefully took it outside and applied a coat of um, Humbrol Matte 49 Rattle Can Varnish, which I can't film unfortunately because I had to do it outside. So all the pigments are now on. Let's take a quick squeeze, move this out of the way. Uh, you won't see much here because this is the front, but I applied it to the bottom of all the feet uh, and in here as well in this little servo area. Let's move this around. You might see better on the other foot. Uh, get this in the light. So you can see now it has this wonderfully muddy look. Because I didn't use the pigment fixer, I just used the matte varnish, it means you do end up still with a lot of sort of lumpy, crusty effect with the dirt. So it does look like dried mud, which is kind of cool. I kind of like that. Uh, got it all up into the inner parts of the leg. I'll just turn it around a bit more and you can see that better. Let's try that one. So you can see here, as I get my finger on the lens, by the way, yes, it's wobbly cam again, because there's no other way to show you this. Uh, you can see here I got the, the dirt and mud in there. And again, because I used the matte varnish, it's come out nice and slightly crusty, like dried on mud rather than just mud dirt staining, which is what I was kind of hoping for. I also put a lot, you can't really see, but I put a lot inside the foot, which was looking a bit clean and pristine. There are some still some clean surfaces like you can see here. Uh, I will be dealing with those in the next episode. Uh, but really pleased with the way that came out. The back of the legs, uh, they managed to, even though they've been matte varnished, they kept their shine. They do actually look quite clean on camera here, um, but they do have some dirt and dust on them. And that's about enough as I want to do, let's show you that one. This one came out a bit dirtier. But that's, on those parts, that's about as dirty and dusty as I want. It works fine for me. I can still see some shine in them, uh, but they look a bit more dirty and used. And I can if I want to, and I may well do in the next episode. Just go over with some uh, chrome silver dry brush on the edges to bring back a bit of the sparkle to those edges. Make it look like bare, exposed and regularly scuffed metal. Uh, and on the back of the legs, came out really nice. I'm quite pleased with how it's all come out. 
Um, it doesn't really come out on camera, it kind of looks all very uniform, but it just looks nice and dirty and muddy now. So if I just pull out and give you another view, uh, do one of these again. Now, I've got to try and fit him in shot, because he's quite big as you know, and I can't really get him all in shot. So we'll just focus on his butt for a minute. And you can see there how it blends down, gets dirtier and dirtier as you go towards the ground. And then you're to the ground there where there would be more dirt logically. As you go up the Gundam, he gets cleaner and cleaner till you get to the head. And there's not really any dirt or dust on there. I've not really done anything to the torso and the arms since you last saw me do those. Purely because they're away from the ground, so they're not going to get as much dirt and dust. The elbows you can see on the arms are still quite clean and shiny. Um, and I intend to keep them that way. I want some grime and grease, but not like on the legs. So if I just turn him around, dee, dee, dee. and again, just a quick update. Uh, most of the stuff, we, we've worked exclusively on the legs for the last couple of episodes, but you can see now how it goes from looking dirty and grimy all the way down, and then it gets more grime and more dirt until you're really in the territory of mud and dirt. Now, this would look great if I stuck it into a diorama where it would all blend in really nicely. If I made sure the, the earth tones matched. But that's how we're going to leave it. So, where are we up to now? So, this is pretty much done now. Uh, I've got a couple of little bits of, of uh, detail touching in to do, which we'll do in the next episode. Just little bits of shiny silver here and there that I want to do. Uh, still got the beam rifle uh, and the hands to do. You can see the hands are completely missing. You know what? I think I prefer the rear view, if you pardon the expression. I think his legs look much better from the back than they do from the front. Um, but we shall be doing a little bit of detail touch in next time. Uh, there's not really much more weathering to do on the figure on this mobile suit. So we do have the beam rifle to do and the hands. We've got to make them look appropriately weathered. So stay tuned for the next one. Uh, until then. Yep, don't forget that bit. Uh, this video is kindly not sponsored by, but they have provided all the weathering stuff for this video. So do pop along to emodels.co.uk, uh, what I think is the best uh, online model supply store in the UK. Uh, so much stuff available from them, from brushes to tools to paints to kits. As I always say, if they haven't got it, you don't need it. So do pop along to them. Also go to their Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash emodelsltd. It's a really great little community on there. Post up your work and show it off and look at the stuff other people have done. Uh, and lastly, as always, go and check out my stuff, uh, www.modelmaking.guru. I'm also on the YouTubes uh, as Model Making Guru. I post up my own stuff, commission builds, fun builds, other bits and bobs. I also show you how to make the perfect pot noodle. worth subscribing to me as well as eModels. Subscribe to them on YouTube. Uh, don't forget that. Obviously if you're watching this on their channel you're already subscribed and if you're not make sure you're subscribed. So anyway that's going to do it. I always get to this point of video and run out of things to say and just waffle incessantly so I shall now go away. Have yourselves a great weekend if this is going up on a Friday. If you're watching this in the middle of the week yeah, have a good weekend anyway. And I'll stop talking now. Adios amoebas! Happiness, happiness.